A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Back in 1974, the house at 112 Ocean Avenue in Long Island, New York, had a little white sign hanging in front that read, High Hopes. At that time, the outside of this Dutch colonial home had white lattice on the side and white shutters that covered one of its most distinct features, the windows. It was the two top windows on the side of the house that helped make it one of the most famous houses in the world. These two windows were shaped like perfect slices of pie, and the way that they fit into the framework gave the illusion that they were the eyes of the house. The effect was ominous and, frankly, a little unsettling. It made one feel like the house was always watching you. They later became synonymous with the horror and tragedy of what happened inside the home in November 1974, when six people were murdered there. After the murders, the house was thought by many to be one of the most haunted houses in the world. It became legendary, and those windows fed into the feeling of it having a life and personality of its own. But that had less to do with the gruesome murders that were committed there and more to do with the ghosts and demons that supposedly resided in the house. Some people even believe that those angry spirits were actually the ones behind the murders and that the house had a mind of its own. This is the real story behind the house that came to be known as the Amityville Horror House. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It's difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is about Ron DeFeo and the real story behind the Amityville Horror. 1974 was not proving to be a good year for 23-year-old Ron DeFeo Jr. He was struggling with various addictions to alcohol, heroin, and very heavy LSD abuse. He could not seem to stay out of trouble. In September of that year, Ron was arrested after stealing an outboard motor from the Babylon Town Dock and then fleeing in his family's motorboat. He was convicted and sentenced to a year's probation for petty larceny. When I say he couldn't stay out of trouble, I really mean it. Only two months later, he and his co-worker staged a fake robbery and they actually stole $19,000 that he had been entrusted to deposit from his grandfather's car dealership. The plan actually worked until police interviewed Ron and he became enraged and refused to answer any more questions. Reportedly, his father, Big Ronnie, who worked with him at the dealership, became suspicious and questioned him. Ron got very angry and actually threatened to kill his own father. But the real trouble began on November 13th, 1974. Ron DeFeo Jr. arrived at work early, about six in the morning. His father, Big Ronnie, had not shown up to work yet, but no one really thought much of it. Why? One of Ron's younger brothers had been injured playing football, and that Wednesday was his therapy day, so he really was not expected in until later. Around noon, Ron decided 
he was bored, so he left work to hang out with his friends. When he was with them, he told them that he was worried because no one in his family was answering the phone. He said he was calling home just to check in. Then, at 6.30 that night, Ron burst into a bar near his home and announced that his parents had been shot and he needed help. A small group of his friends went back to the house with him and found that not only had his parents been shot, but also his four other siblings. When the police arrived, they found that all of the victims had been shot with a Marlin rifle, a rifle that belonged to Ron DeFeo Jr., At first, the police were distracted by rumors of organized crime. Ron's grandfather supposedly had ties to the Italian mafia. But soon they focused in on Ron Jr. as their primary suspect. He initially claimed to the police that a hitman was the culprit. But once he realized that was not working, Ron confessed to everything. To be clear... This was actually the first version of his confession. Over the years, his story changed many times. But this is what we know for certain about the night of the murders. At 3.30 in the morning, he went into his parents' room and shot his mother and father twice each in the back and side. Then he shot his two younger brothers, once each in the back and then his two sisters, each one in the head. The police were still puzzled by several things, though. The victims were all found face down, as if they were sleeping. Investigators originally thought that maybe they had been drugged, but subsequent autopsies and toxicologies ruled that out. Also, no one heard the high-powered rifle firing off eight shots. And that was unusual because those rifles are very loud when discharged, and one would think that should have been heard by the neighbors. But the murder and those puzzling details were just the beginning of the legend of the house on Ocean Avenue in Amityville, Long Island. In December of 1975, over a year after the DeFeo family was killed, George and Kathy Lutz bought 112 Ocean Avenue. And then, just 28 days later, they fled from the home, claiming that they had been terrorized by evil spirits. This launched a ghost story that has now become one of the most well-known in modern history. So what do we know about the killer behind one of the most famous haunted house stories? Ron DeFeo Jr.'s father and mother, Big Ronnie, and Louise DeFeo married despite Louise's parents' disapproval of their relationship. In fact, Louise's parents didn't even speak to the young couple until Ron Jr. was born in September of 1951. Big Ronnie was known to be abusive and volatile, especially with his wife. Friends of Ron recall frequently seeing his mother with black eyes and bruises all over her body. The eldest of Big Ronnie and Louise's five children, Ron Jr., also bore the brunt of his father's anger and harsh discipline. At Ron's trial for the murders, his uncle testified that he had witnessed Big Ronnie abusing Ron when the boy was just two years old. He told this story, quote, We were all sitting down in the basement watching TV, and, I don't know, the boy had done something. All of a sudden, he stood up, the father, and just pushed the boy this way into the wall. The boy banged his head or part of his shoulder or something. Ron's situation became worse when he went to school. He was overweight as a child, and back in the 50s, that was highly unusual. If a kid was overweight, it set them apart from the other kids, and we all know what that means, being bullied. 
and Ron was bullied terribly. This continued into his teenage years when he began to use a powerful drug, amphetamines, to lose weight. In the 60s and 70s, what they were called at the time is a diet pill. It'll kill your appetite. In fact, it's a very powerful stimulant and should never be given to a child or even a teenager whose mind isn't fully developed. It can cause rapid mood swings, depression, angry outbursts. None of it's good. But amphetamines were not the only drug Ron was using. He also began to abuse LSD and heroin and to drink scotch every day. These substances encouraged the darkness in Ron, and by the age of 17, he was expelled from school for volatile behavior. We didn't know it back then, but alcohol and drug use can harm a developing brain. And scientists agree that for a human being, the brain is not fully developed until the mid-20s. What that means is, by the time Ron was 23 and committed these crimes, his brain was used to lots of drugs and was probably damaged by them as well. His parents were very worried about him. They took him to see a psychiatrist. But he told the psychiatrist he didn't need his help, that he didn't need anybody's help, so he stopped going to the appointments. Not only did Ron not go to his appointments with a psychiatrist, He frequently didn't even show up for work, but he was still paid. Remember, it was a family dealership. The parents knew he wasn't there. They knew he wasn't working, but they still bought him lavish gifts and gave him money. The majority of that money went towards his drug habit. By the time he was a teenager, his addiction to heroin was firmly in place. The combination of the drugs Heroin's a downer, amphetamines are an upper, LSD is a hallucinogen, in addition to the fifth of scotch he says he consumed daily, made his behavior even more erratic and volatile. Everyone in the town knew that Ron had a temper and that he could explode. It wasn't a secret. One time he was hunting with a friend and threatened him with the rifle. And he also tried to shoot his dad with a shotgun when his parents were arguing. He actually pointed the shotgun at his father and pulled the trigger. The gun malfunctioned and Ron just left, but his father was stunned. This is a very important aspect of the story. Ron believed that he was going to shoot his father. He pulled the trigger. It was just the gun that failed. That is proof that behaviorally, he was very, very capable of killing someone, including his own family. This should have been a warning sign, but it was not given the serious attention it should have had. A short temper can often be one of the signs of what psychologists call intermittent explosive disorder, or IED. This is a condition that is characterized by sudden outbursts of violence, aggression, and rage. These reactions are disproportionate to the situation, or they're simply irrational. Everyone can lose their temper once in a while, but individuals with IED, they have frequent outbursts, and sometimes over little tiny things. People with IED may destroy property or get into ridiculous arguments, throw tantrums, and sometimes attack others verbally or physically. Usually these outbursts are short-lived. It's unusual for it to last more than half an hour, but I can tell you this, the outbursts come on without warning. After the blow-up, the person might feel very tired and experience guilt. However, As they go into attack mode, they can have a sense of emotional detachment. That detachment can manifest itself in several ways. Stress hormones can cause the body to react in such a way that the person feels emotionally numb. For example, stress hormones can affect the limbic system, which is located in the center of your brain. The limbic system is responsible for your emotions. 
Stress hormones can also affect other hormones in your body, which in turn can affect your mood. And both effects can cause a person to feel numb. The depletion of both emotional and physical energy can also create this emotional numbness. According to the Mayo Clinic, intermittent explosive disorder starts generally after the age of six, but mostly surfaces in the teen years. Most people with IED grew up experiencing explosive behavior and verbal and physical abuse in their homes. Studies have shown that if this is true, being exposed to this type of violence, a child will exhibit the same traits as they get older. People who were abused as children or experienced multiple traumatic events in their childhood have an increased risk of developing IED. I am aware of two different men that I knew who actually had this disorder. When they would get angry, they would leave their house, go into the backyard, and just curse. And you you would think they were angry at the tree they were talking to. One of them told me, Candace, I have to get away from my family when this comes on so I won't hurt them. Unfortunately, not everyone has this kind of insight into their problem. When it comes to the case of Ron DeFeo, this all makes sense. Since he was a toddler, Ron was constantly exposed to a barrage of verbal and physical abuse, and the abuser was his own father. The emotional bullying that he took at school just for being a little overweight did not help. Ron was described as suffering from dissociative disorder by the psychiatrist who was hired by his defense team. A dissociative disorder is the psychological term for someone whose personality kind of splits. One of the most popular and well-known types of dissociative disorders is multiple personality disorder, which is very rare, actually, but it's a very common defense for people that are on trial for murder. They're essentially claiming, hey, I didn't do it. Another personality inhabiting my body did it. This was all done to back up the defense's claim that Ron heard voices, and the voices were telling him to kill his family. But given that Ron later admitted that this was all made up, that diagnosis can be ruled out. The prosecution psychiatrist claimed that Ron simply had antisocial personality disorder. This meant that Ron was aware of his actions, but was too self-centered to care about their impact on others. He knew right from wrong, and he chose to do wrong. In fact, being self-centered has less to do with antisocial personality disorder than a complete lack of empathy for the pain and suffering of others, not to mention a total lack of guilt for harming others. As I mentioned earlier, after Ron's arrest, his versions of the story continually changed. Watching some of the interview footage of him, he would even change his story mid-sentences sometimes and would admit that he had lied in the past. He appeared to not be able to tell the truth about anything or be consistent with his details. That's a characteristic found in pathological liars, and it is common that people who have antisocial personality disorder are also pathological liars. This is different than being a compulsive liar. A pathological liar lies constantly, sometimes to get their way, and is not usually aware that they are doing it. There's not always a clear and obvious motivation as to why they are telling the lie, and sometimes the lies can be self-incriminating. They don't care or respect the rights of others' feelings when they lie, and they are often considered manipulative. They're lying to get what they want. They don't want to go about it in a straightforward manner. Hey, can I borrow $5? With them, it's you know, my grandmother had to be rushed to the hospital and I ran out of gas and I left my wallet at home. And the whole thing's a lie. They just wanted $5. But it's more fun for them to lie than it is to say, hey, can you lend me five? 
Pathological liars, as opposed to compulsive liars, are usually goal-oriented. They are focused, and they create elaborate stories that they will stick to, and they'll even expand upon the lie. This is different than a compulsive liar who lies out of habit. Compulsive lying is often associated with bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, and ADHD. However, and this is important, an individual does not have to have any of those disorders to be considered a compulsive liar. Compulsive liars are much more common than pathological liars. Compulsive liars bend the truth about big things and small things. They generally do it to avoid a confrontation. For example, why are you late for dinner? Oh, oh, terrible heavy traffic, terrible accident. They just made it up. But it gets the individual off their back for explaining why they're late for dinner. In the weeks following his initial confession, Ron DeFeo consistently lied to police, relatives, friends, and the media. And each lie became more and more elaborate. He said them all with such conviction, I wonder if he might have believed them. It was probably easier for him to believe that he was not responsible for killing his four innocent siblings in their bed. I think he was creating that fantasy not only so that the public and the parole board would not judge him harshly, but so that he himself would not have to face his crimes. Many people that committed murder that I interviewed did the same thing. According to Dr. Charles Dyke, the medical director of Connecticut's Department of Mental Health, quote, it has been observed that pathological liars believe their lies to the extent that the belief may be delusional. As a result, pathological lying has been referred to as a wish psychosis. I wish this was true so much. I wish it were true that I did not strangle my girlfriend. I wish it were true that I did not kill my family. And if I wish it enough and tell it to myself enough, I'll believe it. So is it possible for somebody to convince themselves that something they did did not happen? Does pathological lying fit as a diagnosis to Ron? When Ron ran to the bar that night to get help, did he actually believe his lies? Well, if Ron's diagnosis from the prosecutor psychiatrist that he had antisocial personality disorder, meaning he was a psychopath or a sociopath, and I believe that is a correct diagnosis, then he was acting at the bar and was not delusional. Ron admitted that the dissociative disorder diagnosis by the defense, meaning somebody else did it, somebody else inside my body, he admitted that diagnosis was made up. People with antisocial personality disorder are well known for lying when the truth would be easier. They lie because it's fun for them. They love thinking they are pulling the wool over the eyes of what they consider stupid and inferior people. And to the psychopath or sociopath, everyone else is inferior to them. But here's the key. If Ron were truly delusional when he ran in the bar, why did he later, in about 12 hours, admit to police that he murdered everyone? Delusional people don't fade in and out of their delusion hour by hour or even day by day. As a psych nurse, for many, many years, I worked with many delusional people who had to be hospitalized. Even when they're sleeping, their delusions are in control of them. So no, Ron was not delusional. These types of cases are very rare. For a grown son living with his family to kill the entire family. Yes, there are cases of younger children, teenagers, killing their parents, or sometimes the whole family. There are about a hundred cases that can be found in America and Great Britain in the last hundred years of family annihilators. Another term for this is called familicide, but in most of these cases, it is the father of the family that is the killer. When this happens, usually the father is clinically depressed. He kills his entire family and then commits suicide. 
what's going on there is he believes it's an act of love that he is sparing his family from a cold and cruel world. Or sometimes the father simply wants to be rid of the responsibilities of a wife and children. He kills them all and then disappears. The story of the Amityville murders gained notoriety beyond the story of Ron DeFeo Jr. After his arrest, the house was put up for sale and it sold a year after the murders to George and Kathy Lutz. Their family moved into the DeFeo house at 112 Ocean Avenue, then moved out, or should I say ran out, only 28 days later. They claimed they were terrified by the supernatural activity happening in the house. There was a book written about their experience, and it was treated as a nonfiction account. The Lutzes did not actually write the book, but submitted around 45 hours of taped recollections to the writer. Among the experiences the family claims to have had, greenish-black slime oozed from the ceilings and walls and claimed to have seen what they described as a demonic pig with red eyes flying around and staring in their daughter's bedroom window at night. This electrified the general public. They couldn't get enough of the Lutz's story. There was a parade of psychics and paranormal experts that declared the house to be one of the most haunted and evil that they had ever been witness to. Not surprisingly, this captured the attention of Hollywood, and there have been several variations of this story on film and in books. Most notably, the movie, The Amityville Horror. The original film came out five years after the DeFeo family was murdered, but the public's fascination with this story continues even to this day. There is a reason why some of us might gravitate towards scary stories. Psychoanalyst Carl Jung believed horror films, and I quote, tapped into primordial archetypes buried deep in our collective subconscious. Images like shadow and mother play an important role in the horror genre. An article in Psychology Today described how watching violent or frightening movies is a form of catharsis, of purging the negative emotions or pent-up aggression we may feel. Dr. Dolph Zillman furthered the catharsis theory by creating the Excitation Transfer Theory, or ETT. In an article on the website Filmmaker IQ, ETT was summarized as saying that negative feelings created by horror movies actually intensify the positive feelings when the hero triumphs in the end. But what about movies where the hero does not triumph? And even some small studies have shown that people's enjoyment was actually higher during the scary parts of a horror film than it was afterwards. According to Dr. Deirdre Johnson, there are four classifications for why we like watching horror movies. Number one, the gore watchers. Gore watchers typically have low empathy, high sensation seeking, and among males only, a strong identification with the killer. Next are the thrill watchers. Thrill watchers typically have both high empathy and sensation seeking. They identify themselves more with the victims and like the suspense of the film. The third one, independent watchers. Independent watchers typically have a high empathy for the victim along with positive effect for overcoming fear. And lastly, problem watchers. Problem watchers typically have high empathy for the victim, but were characterized by negative affect, particularly a sense of helplessness. There's also a physiological response to these types of movies. Sociologist Margie Kerr identifies fear and wrote a book called Scream, Chilling Adventures into the Science of Fear. 
In the book, she reveals that scary movies will quicken your heart rate and make the body want to expend energy. She says, some might make a positive meaning out of that. They feel really alive, are grounded in their bodies, almost like how you feel after a really intense yoga class or something that focuses all attention into your body. However, she goes on to state, for other people, they might interpret that almost like a panic attack where they're feeling a sense of loss of control over what their body is doing. This intense physiological reaction usually occurs in people who are highly sensitive. They are called HSP, highly sensitive people. They are usually people who are more empathetic and easily overstimulated by their environment. They do not respond well to these types of movies. Of course, the popcorn drama of the horror films that were spawned by the Amityville murders really do not get to the main tragedy. Six people, including four children, lost their lives by the hand of a very real person. It was Ron DeFeo Jr. that killed them, and not any ghost or demon. Ron DeFeo's trial began on October 14, 1975, almost a year after the murders occurred. At the advice of his lawyer, Ron DeFeo pled not guilty by reason of insanity. He said he killed his family in self-defense because he claimed to hear their voices in his head, plotting to kill him. The jury, however, did not buy it. Ron DeFeo was found guilty on six counts of second-degree murder and was sentenced to six consecutive sentences of 25 years to life. He was denied parole several times before he died on March 12, 2021. The story of the Amityville horrors lives on. Ironically, the story is not really even about Ron DeFeo, but rather the Lutzes that moved into the house after him. Amityville is over the publicity, and they've tried to rid themselves of the very crime that put them on the map. After receiving so many complaints about the constant crowds that would come just to stare at the house, the town changed the address of the house so that fans of the horror story would not know where it was located. And the new owners had the infamous windows that had frightened so many filled in and replaced. Before he died, Ron himself said that the Lutz's claims were a scam and that any thought of there being demons and ghosts in the house that made him do it were false and ridiculous. In a prison interview in 1994, DeFeo said, and I quote, I guess the Amityville horror really is supposed to be me because I'm the one that got convicted of killing my family. I'm the one they say who did it. I'm the one that's supposed to be possessed by the devil. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. Next week on Killer Psyche, I'll be covering Ed Gein, Hollywood's favorite killer. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Maxwell Carney. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are our production assistants, and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. This series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Treefort.